<clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Sue Silverman, and it's uh, both an honor and a privilege for me to uh, introduce Dr. Paul Shin as today's Ferenc A. Ulez Research Seminar Lecturer. Dr. Shin has been at the Brigham for 14 years and is now Associate Professor at Harvard Medical School. Um, and he has uh, done a lot for the department, serving as the department's medical director of the Cross-Sectional Interventional Radiologist Service until 2019. He's also been a very valuable member of the Abdominal Imaging and Intervention Division. Um, he's served it in many ways. First and foremost, Paul is an outstanding radiologist who's proficient in both imaging and intervention. However, his major focus has been in interventional radiology where he's well known for his outstanding skill. Paul takes on the most difficult procedures in the division, some that few in the country would even attempt in my opinion. He's currently working on several innovative ways to improve IR techniques. Some will be highlighted today. Others are just too numerous to mention in this introduction. So let me focus on today's topic and how it relates to when we hired him 14 years ago. Paul graduated from medical school at the University of Texas at Galveston and did his radiology residency at the Oxner Clinic. He completed an abdominal radiology fellowship at UCSF uh, in 1991. He then pursued private practice in Fort Worth, Texas for 16 years, when in 2007, he reached out to me looking to return to academics. Uh, you may not know, but switching from private practice to academics is difficult and, and therefore unusual. Uh, but I was very impressed with Paul. He had started virtually on his own a PET-CT service and a tuber ablation service in private practice. And of course, he was highly recommended by his private practice uh, partners. And Paul has since parlayed those interests in nuclear medicine and IR into an outstanding research portfolio in interventional PET-CT. As you'll see today, he's demonstrating how PET-CT guided ablation is poised to become an important advance in the field of image guided tumor ablation. His work is benefiting patients with disease, not only in the abdomen, but elsewhere in the body. And of course, as he's enriching the image guided therapy program and I know Claire Tempany and when Dr. Ulez was alive, was very excited and proud of Paul's work. Um, his work in PET-CT ablation, I think is truly groundbreaking. Paul's a trailblazer, and today you will get a look at the wonderful work he's doing here at the Brigham and why the work is so exciting. So without further ado, I introduce Dr. Paul Shin, whose lecture is entitled PET-CT Guided Tumor Ablation, Myths and Promises. Paul? Stu, thank, thank you so much for that. Uh very generous introduction. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, Stu hired me 14 years ago to join this department and this division, and I'll always be grateful for that. Um, and Stu has been an unbelievable uh, mentor for me throughout these years and uh, uh, provided incredible support, so I'm, I'm grateful. And thank you for the opportunity today to uh, present. Okay, so uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, by way of introduction, I think it's useful to look back at clinical PET-CT. When it came uh, on the scene, it was viewed as a disruptive technology. It, it blended molecular imaging with anatomic imaging, and it was a bit of a painful transition, uh, but it, it led to amazing uh, results in, in cancer imaging. And I think we're now witnessing a similar marriage of uh, PET-CT molecular imaging with interventional radiology. And it's similarly presenting challenges and opportunities. At present, there are very few molecular imagers who perform interventional procedures and few interventionalists that are molecular imagers. So I structured this talk uh, around myths and misconceptions uh, in the field of PET-CT intervention. And we'll use that to take you through what we've learned, including a big surprise, and then finish up with uh, what's next. Why do we think there are myths and misconceptions? Well, it's really through conversations with our colleagues here and, and uh, elsewhere, people that visit us in the Amigo, uh, conversations at meetings, and even comments uh, from peer review when we submit manuscripts for publication. In fact, we prepared a primer with one of our recent publications that uh, defined ablation terms, ablation concepts, and concepts unique to PET-CT guided ablation uh, uh, to be helpful for the reviewers, and we suggested that uh, that it could even be considered as an online supplement, which they they decided to 
uh, to include with, with, that, with that particular publication. So myth number one, Tumors may not remain visible on FDG PET throughout a long procedure because of radioactive decay. Well, F18, uh, the radionuclide for FDG does have a half-life of about two hours. So if you inject the tracer one hour before the procedure, that means one hour into the procedure, you have about 50% of the activity that you started with. And three hours into the procedure, maybe about 20% of the activity. Uh, but it turns out PET can still image uh, tumors with that amount of activity on board. And it's important to realize that tumor conspicuity is not just about the absolute activity in the tumor, but it has a lot to do with tumor to background ratio of activity. So many diagnostic PET studies have shown over the years that if you obtain a PET scan at one hour after a, a tracer administration and compare it to scans obtained at two or even three hours after tracer administration, we often pick up additional tumors on the later time point scans. And we've actually observed this in our, in our procedures that tumors that we're targeting sometimes become more visible later in the procedure. So we really don't have a problem with ability to visualize tumors throughout a long procedure. And this visibility of tumors on PET is helpful in many regards. Some tumors are uh, invisible on CT, such as this recurrent mesothelioma in the chest wall. It was FDG AVID, which allowed us to target it for cryoablation. This recurrent lung cancer was completely obscured on CT by surrounding radiation pneumonitis, but we were able to on PET CT target it for biopsy and ablation. This small tumor that was a recurrence from adrenal cortical carcinoma between the uh, uh, inferior vena cava and the cruise of the diaphragm was targeted for both biopsy and ablation. And even the metallic artifacts that might obscure the nodule on CT are not a problem for PET and allows us to see the relationship of the tumor to the probes. And of course, sometimes we pick up unexpected tumors that we didn't uh, know were present. Uh, in, this, in this case, there on the bottom two rows, there were known metastases uh, to the liver or adjacent to the liver. But on the top row, we picked up additional unsuspected tumor which we also targeted during that procedure to improve the outcome. This patient had lung metastases that we ablated. Yes, they were visible on CT, but when we do the procedure, you know, we distorted the anatomy by creating a pneumothorax so that we could displace the nodule away from the mediastinum where the phrenic nerve was located. And things happen during lung ablations. We get hemorrhage that can obscure the nodule, atelectasis that can obscure it and change the anatomy. And the ablation itself causes consolidation that obscures the nodule. But no matter what happens, we can obtain a PET CT at that time point in the scan and still see the nodule where it truly is located. So we think of FDG PET as our beacon in the fog during these interventional procedures in PET CT. Myth number two, PET CT procedures are too long to be practical. Well, one thing we noticed early on is that we can acquire PET scans as short as 20 seconds. Traditionally, diagnostic PET acquisitions per bed position are at least one minute long, sometimes three minutes long. Uh, in this case, we looked at 20 second reconstructions all the way up to three minute reconstructions of PET. And yes, the three minute image is prettier, it's smoother, but on the 20 second PET, even though it's a little bit noisy, we can still get the same uh, spatial localization of the tumor, and we still see the shape and size of the tumor. So that meant that we could do very short, single uh, uh, bed position PET CT scans with a PET acquisition of 15 to 20 seconds and get the entire PET CT in a single breath hold as short as 35 seconds. That's pretty impressive and pretty fast. And we retrospectively compared the duration of our PET CT guided procedures to comparable CT guided procedures. And what we found was, if you look at this uh, uh, graph on the left, the blue box and whisker plot is the duration of our PET CT guided procedures. The red box and whisker plots are the CT guided procedures by different operators. And the duration was not that different. On average, PET CT guided procedures were about 22 to 28 minutes longer, which is very reasonable. And the dose, radiation dose to the patients was only minimally uh, larger. 
So we think PET-CT is certainly fast enough for interventional oncology. And additionally, we can adjunctively use ultrasound or CT fluoroscopy to expedite the procedure. And there are more strategies that I'll get to towards the end of the talk. Myth number three, radiation dose to the operators is too high. Well, it is true that wearing our lead aprons is not helpful. The 511 KEB photons from positron decay uh, penetrate our lead aprons, and so it doesn't help to wear lead aprons. But study, many studies have looked at operator dose, and it's actually very well within uh, 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 acceptable standards and not that much different than other, other interventional radiology procedures that we perform. But there are things to remember. One is that we can minimize our dose by using the, the least amount of activity necessary that we inject into the patient. We also minimize our time in close proximity to the patient. So when we're not actively manipulating devices, we can step back. And we're even uh, using a custom rolling lead shield that we had made for the Amigo this has one inch thick lead. It blocks almost all of like 95 plus percent of the uh, 511 KEV photons. But the real question is, do we, is it really even worth the effort to use this because the operator dose is not that great? Myth number four, tumor radio tracer activity is attenuated or dissipated by thermal ablation. This is a big one. And you know, when people think at first blush, we give FDG at the beginning of the procedure, the tumor takes up the activity, then we ablate it. The tumor's dead. Why would it be hot on PET? Well, let's look at that. So if you have a tumor in the liver, you give FDG, the tumor's hot, there's FDG trapped in the tumor cells, and then you do an ablation. You either freeze it or you heat it. Well, the temperatures that we cause with thermal ablation, whether we heat it or freeze it, do not change the rate of radioactive decay of our isotopes. And uh, the thermal ablation process actually uh, isolates that part of the liver. The ablation zone becomes devascularized. It's no longer perfused by blood. So it traps everything in the ablation zone. There's no place for the radiopharmaceutical to go. So the, tra the tracer decays at the rate it would even if you didn't do ablation and the tumor remains visible after ablation for the, for the several hours following ablation. We documented this in a study in which we compared our PET-CT guided radiofrequency and cryoablation procedures and compared them with PET-CT guided biopsies. We looked at the SUV of the tumors before at the beginning of the procedure and compared it to the SUV of the tumors at the end of the procedure. And there was no significant difference between the ablation group and the biopsy group. In fact, the SUVs increased at, at the end of the procedure, as you would expect, based on dual time point diagnostic PET studies in the past. The tumor to background activity actually improves as you get later into the procedure. So this persistent tumor visibility, even after ablation, has implications for us in interventional PET. One is that we can certainly use PET for initial targeting of tumors. And then no matter what happens during the procedure, uh, we can retarget the tumor, even if we've lost visibility of the tumor on our CT scan. And we can now consider how to use PET to assess the tumor ablation results. And we certainly cannot look, uh, expect to see the, the radioactivity to disappear because of ablation. That's not going to work. So we'll have to find another strategy. So before we get into that, when we assess ablation results, the most important thing we're looking for is the adequacy of our ablation margin. That is how far beyond the tumor we've ablated. And this is analogous to the surgical margin. When the surgeons resect a tumor, the specimen goes to pathology, they slice it, and they look under a microscope to see how close the tumor approaches the resection margin. If it is at the margin, that's a bad indicator. The patient is gonna have a recurrence. If it's a wide margin, very little chance of recurrence. It's the same thing for our ablation procedures. We want to achieve an ablation margin that's at least five to 10 millimeters in thickness. And not only that, the minimum margin is critical. In other words, you can have a thick margin around most of the tumor, but if in one spot you have a zero margin, that's the weak link in the chain 
and that's where your recurrence is going to occur. So we need to be able to assess the entire margin and find the minimum margin and be able to measure it. So schematically, if you look at it, a blue, this blue tumor we're going to ablate. The ablation zone uh, is this egg-shaped structure surrounding the tumor. So the ablation zone or volume includes the blue tumor and the yellow margin, which is how far beyond the tumor we've ablated. And it looks like a thick margin all the way around, but on the top right, we can see where the minimum margin is located. And if it's less than five millimeters, we consider that inadequate. Now, why do we need the margin? Well, it's because there can be microscopic extensions of tumor or small satellite nodules that measure three or four millimeters in size or one or two millimeters in size that we cannot resolve on our conventional imaging modalities. And if we don't include this in our margin, we're gonna have a recurrence. That's why we need the margin. Myth number five, the ablation margin can be reliably assessed on contrast enhanced CT or ultrasound. Well, this is how we have traditionally assessed our ablation results while the patient is still on the table because we didn't have anything else. But this is what we see. When we give contrast at the end of the ablation, the liver is perfused but the ablation zone is no longer perfused by blood, it's coagulated. And so the white arrows show the hypoenhancing ablation zone. But notice that we cannot define the tumor within the ablation zone, it's obscured. And this is just another example. The ablation zone is beautifully demonstrated on contrast CT, but the tumor is not visible within the ablation zone. So we cannot directly measure the margin and our metallic ablation device is contributing to the problem because of its metallic artifacts. But we like to know how adequate our margin is at this point, because if we need to do an overlap, we can then just reposition the probe very easily. Contrast enhanced ultrasound has the same problem. The ablation zone is non-perfused. We cannot define the tumor within the ablation zone. With both of these techniques, if there is hypervascular bulky tumor outside the ablation zone that we didn't ablate, we can pick it up with these techniques, but we cannot assess the ablation margin. Interestingly, this paper just came out recently, it titled, Can Accurate Evaluation of the Treatment Success After Radiofrequency Ablation of Liver Tumors Be Achieved by Visual Inspection Alone? Results of a Blinded Assessment with 38 Interventional Oncologists. What did they find? 44% of the time, the radiologists misjudge the adequacy of the ablation results. And having more expertise wasn't helpful. It's a limitation of the technological approach. So what did they conclude? Conventional side-by-side -side evaluation of treatment success after RFA of liver tumors by the juxtaposition of pre and post-interventional CT scans is very difficult for experienced radiologists. The implementation of advanced processing techniques such as rigid, non-rigid image fusion with the assessment of the periablational margin is thus likely needed in order to decrease errors and objectively evaluate technical success and predict technique efficacy of liver RFA. So we've established that we can nicely define the ablation zone with our contrast enhanced modalities. The problem is that we don't usually see the tumor within the ablation zone. So you may have a nice large ablation zone, but if the tumor is eccentrically located, you may have an inadequate minimum margin. Hence all the interest in image fusion technologies and the countless publications and projects that have used image fusion to try to address both the targeting problem and the uh, ablation margin assessment problem. But what are the challenges? Well, almost all of these technologies require a retrospective data set to demonstrate the tumor after ablation. But between the retrospective data set that might be an MRI obtained two weeks ago, or it might be a contrast enhanced CT scan obtained with the patient on the procedure table at the beginning of the procedure, but then you're fusing it to a CT scan obtained at the end of the ablation procedure. So there's a, it's still a retrospective data set. And there can be changes in the body or organ position that occur, changes in organ shape. Respiratory vari variation is a problem. 
Distortion caused by the insertion of needles and ablation devices is a problem. And we, we cause gross anatomic distortions with our other maneuvers like artificial ascites, artificial pneumothorax, pneumoperitoneum, and so on. And then things like atelectasis and hemorrhage distort the anatomy and obscure the anatomy. And there's substantial tissue contraction that is caused by thermal ablation is another thing that is very difficult to address with retrospective image fusion. So can PET-CT help? Well, not surprisingly, the initial concepts of using PET to address uh, or assess ablation results centered on imaging residual unablated tumor. So for example, in a mouse model, radioactive water perfusion was used to identify residual unablated tumor. In clinical uh, trials, a split dose FDG technique has been advocated where FDG, a small FDG dose is used for targeting of the tumor and then a larger dose is administered after ablation to look for residual unablated tumor. All of these methods are looking for residual unablated tumor. So myth number six, the best way to assess tumor ablation results during PET-CT guided procedures is injecting tracer immediately after ablation to image or measure residual viable tumor. Well, the split dose technique uh, was uh, evaluated in these studies from one center. And in the first study, they looked at 29 tumors. And at the end of the procedure, they gave additional FDG, waited 30 minutes and it imaged. And in 28 of those tumors, they had no detectable residual tumor, but two of them recurred anyway. And the one that did show residual uptake was reablated. Now the median follow-up was five months. The, the longest follow-up was 8.5 months. So it begs the question, you know, were there additional cases with local tumor recurrence? They subsequently tried a more quantitative approach in 2016, where they uh, injected FDG after the ablation and did a large ROI to include the entire ablation zone. And they tried, they compared the maximum pixel activity concentration of FDG within the entire ablation zone, including the, the adjacent tissues, uh, relative to the average uh, FDG activity concentration in normal liver. And they indicated that they were 100% accurate in predicting outcome with this approach. But in a subsequent paper, the same group found that the SUV ratio alone did not prove statistically significant in predicting outcome. So what, what is going on here? Well, I think you know, they're running up against the, the spatial resolution limitations of PET. And this, this actually was early on in the, in the, in the diagnostic PET uh, uh, experience. Many studies were done of uh, patients with melanoma or breast cancer to evaluate regional lymph nodes with PET. And the hope was that maybe PET would be so accurate that we could avoid sentinel node biopsies or regional node dissections. But in fact, PET was not able to pick up foci of tumor as small as two or three millimeters in size, let alone microscopic foci of tumors. So it really didn't pan out as a way to obviate the need for these lymph node uh, dissections. And the same problem is, is uh, illustrated here where we can't really reliably pick up very tiny foci of unablated residual tumor. And of course, we're not getting any information about the ablation margin with these approaches. So if you look at it schematically, let's say we do an ablation and we get an ablation zone that covers the tumor like this. Well, you may have this 10 by 30 millimeter blob of unablated tumor if you eject FDG at the end of the procedure, yes, you're gonna be able to pick this up, that's great. But what if you get an ablation zone like this and you're left with maybe one or two foci of tumor that measure one to three millimeters in size? PET is not going to reliably pick this up. It's really below the detection limits of PET. So suppose you get an ablation zone that covers the entire macroscopic tumor well, if you look more closely, perhaps you have a less than one millimeter margin over here, a two to three millimeter margin over here, uh, you're still at high risk for local recurrence. And why is that? Well, because we talked about the satellite tumors and microscopic extensions of tumor. This is why we need a margin is so that we include these things that we cannot detect on our imaging uh, in the ablation zone to reduce the risk of local recurrence. <clears throat> 
Now, there's all types of uh, research going on on nanoparticle imaging and uh, uh, you know, uh, things like Raman spectroscopy that can potentially even pick up a single malignant cell. Uh, these are uh, uh, technologies that uh, may potentially be very effective for mucosal imaging or imaging within a few millimeters of a mucosal surface. Uh, there, there is some indication that it may be able to detect uh, tumors even deeper than that at some point. Uh, but until these technologies are realized and are able to provide whole body imaging where we can detect sub-millimeter foci of tumor deep in the body or even microscopic foci of tumor, until that happens in the ablation world, we're, we're gonna be focused on achieving an ablation margin. That's, that's what we have to do. So can PET-CT help us assess the margin? Well, we're gonna capitalize on the fact that the tumor remains hot on uh, uh, FDG PET after thermal ablation. And that gives us three uh, PET-CT options for assessing the margin. The first one is if we do an FDG PET-CT guided cryoablation, the tumor will be hot at the end of the cryo. The ice ball is beautifully visualized on CT, sharply marginated. And we're gonna do breath hold PET-CT for excellent co-registration of the two data sets. We recently published our results with these PET-CT techniques and this is what it looks like. At the uh, ice ball, maximum ice ball formation, we do a PET-CT. The tumor is still FDG Abbott on the left. The CT shows the ice ball on the middle image. And on the fused PET-CT, the overlay allows us to measure the, the margin uh, uh, indicated by the asterisk all the way around the tumor on every slice. In this case, the minimum margin was 5.5 millimeters and there was no local recurrence. This patient underwent a palliative cytoreductive ablation. It was a multifocal recurrent mesothelioma. This was the dominant mass. We cryoablated it. The tumor is FDG Abbott on the top left. On the top right, you see the CT depiction of the ice ball. The fused PET CT image C shows that tumor extends to the edge of the ice ball. And of course, that was one of the sites of local progression afterwards. And of course, we can scroll through the data sets, the PET CT data sets, and assess the margin on every single slice, which will help us find the minimum margin. We can also use multiplanar reconstructions. And no matter what type of anatomical distortions we cause, like in this case, we created a large pneumothorax on purpose so that we would avoid going through the lung when we put our probes into the liver dome. And then we could see the ice ball on our fused PET CT at the end of the procedure. And we were able to measure the, the adequacy of the margin all the way around this irregular tumor on, on all slices through the tumor. A second approach is uh, after microwave ablation, doing PET contrast enhanced CT. So we, we're gonna use iodinated contrast. The tumor will be hot after ablation. The contrast enhanced CT shows the non-enhancing ablation zone. And we're gonna do our breath hold PET CT. And this is what it looks like. The tumor is hot on the left. The, the non-enhancing ablation zone is depicted on contrast enhanced CT as part of the PET CT and the fused display on the right allows us to measure the margin all the way around. In this case, the minimum margin was 6.5 millimeters and there was no local recurrence at 27 months. Another case, the tumor was still avid after microwave ablation. We see the ablation zone on contrast CT, but notice on the fused PET CT, the tumor extends all the way to the edge of the ablation zone where the white arrow is. And of course, that was the site of local recurrence. So we, so we looked at our overall results. And one of the nice things that we uh, found was that with PET CT, we're almost always able to assess the margin circumferentially on every slice through the tumor in 95 to 96% of cases. That's compared to MRI obtained after the procedure where it was more like 60% of the time that we were able to fully assess the margin on every slice through the tumor. And when we used five millimeters as our ablation margin, minimum margin threshold, uh, the PET-CT assessment nicely stratified the tumors that were likely to recur from those that were not likely to recur. 10% of tumors with an adequate margin uh, on intraprocedural PET-CT progressed, whereas 41% without an adequate margin 
progressed. The third approach is to do, do perfusion PET after the PET-CT guided ablation. So again, the tumor will be hot after ablation. The ablation zone is devascularized. It's coagulated by microwave ablation. And so we're now gonna do a perfusion PET to bring up activity in the normal unablated liver. And it doesn't require an additional uptake time. We simply inject the perfusion tracer and imme immediately scan. We first reported this in 2018 using N13 ammonia as our perfusion tracer. N13 ammonia is a well-known cardiac perfusion tracer agent uh, used to assess myocardial perfusion, but notice it also perfuses the liver and anywhere else that blood goes. And so the concept looks like this. We have a tumor in, in for example, the liver. We give FDG and it localizes intensely within the tumor. It, there's mild activity throughout the liver. And now we do an ablation. And if the ablation zone looks like this, and if we now obtain a PET CT scan after ablation, it's gonna look pretty similar because the ablation does not dissipate the FDG activity. It doesn't change the rate of decay, but the ablation zone is devascularized. There's no longer blood perfusion into the ablation zone. So if we give a perfusion tracer, that's gonna bring up the background liver activity and leave this uh, photopenic ablation margin. So we have pre-procedural activity trapped in the tumor. We have pre-procedural mild activity plus the perfusion activity in the background normal unablated liver. And that leaves this photopenic ablation margin that we can now assess. And what does that look like? So on the top left, we've targeted an FDG avid tumor. We've done microwave ablation. On the top right, you see the perfusion PET. There's residual trapped FDG from the pre-procedural dose in the tumor. And there is uh, perfusion activity in the normal unablated liver indicated by the asterisk. But the photopenic margin surrounds the entire tumor and it looks pretty generous. And it, when you compare it to the post-contrast enhanced MRI, it also provides a very comparable assessment of the ablation margin. And another example, uh, microwave ablation of an FDG avid liver tumor. On the CT scan with contrast on the top right, we cannot uh, uh, see the tumor where it's obscured by gas. But on the bottom left, the per perfusion PET nicely shows the generous photopenic margin surrounding the entire tumor. Notice in this case on the MRI bottom right, the tumor is partially obscured within the ablation zone and we can't fully assess the margin. Myth number seven, ablation-induced hyperemia will confound the PET-CT assessment of the ablation margin. Well, we do often see increased blood flow surrounding the ablation zone immediately after ablation. And actually this perfusion PET that I just showed you illustrates that. You can see there's increased flow around the ablation zone, but it doesn't penetrate into the ablation zone because it's coagulated and it doesn't interfere with our assessment of the ablation margin. In this case, we did a microwave ablation of a tumor. And on the top right, the perfusion PET is superimposed on the CT image. You can see the U-shaped ablation margin surrounding the tumor posteriorly, but anteriorly normal liver activity blends in with the FDG avid tumor, meaning that we do not have a margin anteriorly, it's zero. And on the post MRI, we found out why that happened. There was a blood vessel draped over this tumor that caused a heat sink. And so we got a zero margin in this location. And, and that's of course where the tumor recurred. So it turned out that N13 ammonia, uh, while it had a short half-life and was potentially repeatable, it was not practical. Uh, number one, we rarely need to repeat the perfusion PET during a procedure. But number two, you can't ask your cyclotron to drop everything and do another run. And most people don't have a cyclotron. So can we use FDG as the perfusion tracer? And the answer is it works beautifully. So we start off with a pre-procedural dose of eight millicuries to localize the tumor for targeting. And then at the end of the ablation, we give an additional three millicurie perfusion dose of FDG and get our perfusion scan. It's not repeatable, but not really an issue. So we've reported our results on FDG uh, perfusion PET to assess ablation results. 
And uh, in this example, we on a coronal PET CT image, you can see that we placed our microwave ablation probe in the upper half of the tumor. The perfusion PET shows a generous ablation margin around most of the tumor, but inferiorly, where the white arrow is, there's normal liver touching the tumor. So we knew that was an inadequate margin. And we did an overlapping ablation during that procedure and did not have a recurrence on long-term follow-up. And so the point is that our PET or PET-CT assessment is obtained intraprocedurally and it potentially affects our procedural decisions and hopefully improves our outcomes. In another case, uh, we ablated a tumor under PET-CT guidance. The perfusion PET on the top right shows a very generous margin all the way around this tumor. Notice that on the MRI bottom left, the tumor is completely obscured within the ablation zone and we can't really measure the margin. And we did not have a recurrence in this case. This was a palliative uh, cytoreductive ablation in a patient with multiple metastases. This was the dominant one. And here the perfusion pet on the right shows that there is a margin on one on part, around part of the mass, the white arrow, but in other areas, there's an, a, a zero margin such as between the dashed arrows. And of course that did progress. Even if we distort the anatomy considerably with hydrodissection, as in this case, where we uh, wanted to push away the projected ablation zone from the anterior abdominal wall, uh, we did our microwave ablation, and then the perfusion PET came at the end of the procedure. And everything we see here reflects the anatomic changes of the procedure because the PET and the CT are obtained contemporaneously. And uh, we have a generous margin in this case. So with perfusion PET, again, we were able to assess the margin very uh, in a high percentage of cases, almost all cases. Uh, compared to MRI obtained 24 hours later, where we could only as fully assess the margin in about two thirds of cases. And using a five millimeter threshold for the minimum margin, perfusion PET was highly predictive of recurrence. And in fact, in only one of 29 tumors where we had a minimum margin greater than five millimeters on perfusion PET, was the tumor incompletely ablated or did it progress? 75% uh, of the tumors that were incompletely ablated or progressed had a zero perfusion PET margin. When you look at the Kaplan-Meier plots for reader one on top and reader two on the bottom with PET on the left and MRI on the right, you can see that both techniques nicely predict ablation outcome using a five millimeter margin threshold. But the difference is that PET was more often able to provide the margin assessment than MRI, and it also it was intraprocedural. So the advantages of perfusion PET are it's a single image modality and it's obtained intraprocedurally. Because it's a single imaging modality, there's no image misregistration issue to deal with. And by obtaining it during a breath hold, we eliminate the motion effects on our PET image. It gives us a direct ablation margin visualization and assessment. It's a true representation of the anatomy at that time point of the procedure, and it avoids iodinated contrast. Myth number eight, PET CT assessment of the ablation margin will not work because of the low spatial resolution of PET. Well, we already discussed that that is a problem when you're looking for microscopic or tiny foci of tumor. But what we're trying to assess with PET-CT is the thickness of the margin. And here, the, the, uh, for the margin to be adequate, it has to measure at least five millimeters in thickness. So if we cannot resolve the margin on PET, it's inadequate by definition. On the other hand, if we can resolve it and it measures more than five millimeters, then we have a good indication of an adequate ablation. Myth number nine, ablation-induced inflammation will cause radio tracer uptake in or around the ablation zone during the procedure. Well, this is what it looks like. And we do see inflammation surrounding ablation zones. Uh, it's outside the ablation zone, but contiguous with it. Uh, but this uptake is predicated on the recruitment of inflammatory cells. And that takes time. And so we can begin to see inflammatory uptake about 24 hours after an ablation, and it can persist for a few months afterwards. But we do not see it during procedures or in the first few hours after a procedure. So it's not an issue when we're trying to assess 
ablation results intraprocedurally. Myth number 10, retrospective image fusion solves the problems of intraprocedural ablation margin assessment. Well, don't get me wrong, retrospective image fusion can definitely improve our assessment of the ablation margin and it is helpful, but it has limitations. And the question is, does PET-CT assess some of these limitations? Well, a big surprise we encountered was that PET can depict the tissue contraction caused by RFA or microwave ablation. The way this happened was I was about to do a microwave ablation of a single metastasis from adrenocortical carcinoma to the liver. The tumor turned out to be isometabolic with normal liver. It had the same amount of uptake as background liver, so it was completely invisible on PET. Fortunately, it was visible on CT as a hypodense mass. So we obtained this PET-CT about 90 minutes or more after the FDG injection. So that's already a significant uptake period. We then put in the probe and immediately did our microwave ablation and obtained a post-PET-CT uh, PET scan image. And to my surprise, there was intense uptake around the probe. And I was initially puzzled by this. I was thinking, you know, it's hard to believe that this is uptake attributable to a later time point uh, of the PET scan. In other words, improved tumor to background activity. It was actually a short interval of time between these two scans and it was pretty intense. And secondly, bleeding into this area didn't seem like a good explanation because microwave cauterizes the tissues. It seals off the volume. And even if there was bleeding into the volume, at this point, uh, at one hour or more after FDG injection, there's very little blood pool activity and it's not gonna be greater than background liver. And again, we talked about inflammatory uptake, that couldn't explain it. So it dawned on me that this is tissue contraction being imaged by PET. So what's happening? Well, all of these cells within the tumor and the background liver have FDG within them. And when the tissue contracted around the microwave ablation probe, it pulled those uh, uh, FDG molecules in closer to the probe so that we now had twice as many FDG molecules per voxel as we did just before the microwave ablation. So this was really pseudo uptake caused by tissue contraction. And so that was a pretty uh, intriguing discovery. And so myth number 11, we just addressed, bleeding into or around the ablation zone uh, does not confound the PET-CT assessment of the ablation zone. Uh, but we, we wanted to further uh, look at this tissue contraction thing. And we were wondering, can we actually see this when we compare our tumors before and after microwave ablation? And so we looked at 36 patients with 41 FDG AVA tumors that we microwave ablated. And when we measured them before and after, we, this, is typically, this is typical of what we saw. This tumor measured 3.6 by 4.2 centimeters before microwave, and it measured 2.9 by 3.9 after. Uh, here's another example on image B is the pre-microwave PET appearance and C is post-microwave. You can visually see the contraction of the tumor. It tends to be greater perpendicular to the probe uh, compared to the long axis. And when we measured this uh, manually, the short axis diameters on average decreased 29%, long axis 24%. Uh, we wanted a more objective assessment of our ablation volume shrinkage. So we used a tumor segmentation uh, software uh, package. And this showed us that our uh, tumor volume decreased on average 45%. And this is in keeping with what it was shown experimentally. So interestingly, there is actually at least one company that has a software package for assessing ablation results that allows you to plug in a correction factor for tissue contraction. I think they suggest 20% or something. But when you look at our results, uh, the, the average contraction was 45% in volume, but the, the range, the standard deviation was uh, like from minus 15 to minus 75%. That's quite a range. And so if you're gonna plug in a correction factor, which one do you use? Uh, the point is it's variable, the amount of tissue contraction. It tends to 
it depends on how much water content there is in the tumor and the tissues and so on. Myth number 12, PET CT misregistration will limit the accuracy of tumor targeting or ablation margin assessments. We initially addressed this by doing breath hold PET CT with a, a bellows device where we monitored the level of inspiration. But we, in truth, we do almost all of our liver ablations under general anesthesia. So we instead started doing breath hold PET CT under general anesthesia where, where we stopped the ventilator for 35 to seconds to 90 seconds, which is very well tolerated. And that gave us excellent co-registration of our uh, uh, tumors on PET CT images um, and also projected ablation zones were uh, very tightly overlapped and uh, uh, similar on, on uh, showing that we had good registration of our PET and CT data sets. So not only are the PET and CT well registered, but they're acquired contemporaneously, almost simultaneously. And here's a dramatic illustration of why that makes a difference. Here was a large tumor in the left liver that needed to be ablated. Uh, it's right next to the stomach. You can see on the coronal image. And so we created an artificial pneumoperitoneum that would allow us to displace the liver from the stomach. We inserted the cryoprobes into the tumor, and then we placed towels on the handles to lift the liver away from the stomach. And you can see we got nice separation on this sagittal image. And as we got to the maximum ice ball, we did a breath hold PET CT. And despite this radical and anatomical distortion that we're causing during this procedure, both the PET and the CT are obtained almost simultaneously. They're perfectly co-registered and we can see what our ablation margin is. It's, it's, you simply cannot do this with retrospective image fusion technologies. And of course, we had a great outcome in this case. So what's next? You know, we, are, we already use CT fluoroscopy during CT guided procedures, and we actually have CT fluoroscopy installed on our PET CT scanner in the Amigo. But is it possible to do PET CT fluoroscopy? Well, CT fluoroscopy is something that allows us to, we step on a foot pedal, we get a, C, a, a sort of a low dose CT image, it's a partial rotation CT image uh, that we can see almost real time. And, it, and it's while we're in the room and it allows us to work very quickly and precisely to do our procedures. Uh, so we approached our manufacturer to see, is there a way we can fuse one of our intraprocedural PET scans with a CT fluoro image? And they really were not able to help us with their current platform. Uh, so we reached out to a third party uh, company that has a, a device called the IGT Fusion. And they are uh, now working with us and we're starting to obtain intraprocedural PET CT fluoroscopy images that look like this. Now, currently, the setup requires a manual push. So uh, from the time I push the pedal and get the CT fluoro image, it's about 25 seconds before I get the fused PET CT image displayed in the room. But you can see that this is really exciting because now we can get intraprocedural, near, near real time PET CT fluoroscopy images that can expedite the procedure and help us do very precise things with PET CT fluoro near real-time in-room PET-CT fluoroscopy. Well, to finish up, you know, we, we talked about the challenges with image fusion and how does PET-CT address this? I hope I've convinced you that it, it, it addresses a lot of the problems. For one thing, we don't need a retrospective data set. So this helps us account for differences in body organ position that occur during the procedure or changes in organ shape. By doing breath hold PET CT, we account for respiratory variation. By doing scans uh, at any time point in the procedure, we can account for the distortions of devices and uh, maneuvers like the artificial ascites. Even atelectasis and hemorrhage do not uh, uh, prevent us from getting accurate anatomic depictions. And even the substantial tissue contraction caused by ablation is taken into account by our uh, PET images and PET CT images. So the promises of PET CT in interventional oncology, I think, are pretty substantial. Uh, yes, it will be an awkward transition. We still have to work through reimbursement issues. 
and many departments will have to address workflow challenges uh, to, to make this happen. Uh, it clearly requires integrating different domains of expertise, just as we did with PET-CT in the beginning. Uh, but as we increasingly move into molecular-based diagnosis and treatment, I think interventional oncologists will be able to capitalize on the image fusion uh, capabilities of contemporaneous PET-CT data sets, the novel approaches to tumor ablation margin assessment that it, that it provides, uh, of course, the use of novel and new radiopharmaceuticals, and then the technology of PET-CT is improving. Uh, PET MR technology is now here. That's going to be used for intervention. And who knows what else we haven't thought of. So this is a partial listing of the many people who have worked with us uh, and collaborated with us on our PET CT procedures and projects. And I, I, I know I've left names off here, but uh, it's a partial listing. And I'm uh, grateful to all of these individuals. And uh, with that, I will stop and uh, happy to answer any questions. See everyone, I told you Paul's a trailblazer. <laughs> um, are there any questions? Great talk, Paul, thank you so much. Um, love that. Fluoro, near real-time fluoro approach. What's that going to take and how can we get it even be shorter than 25? What was the seconds you were before you see it? Yeah, so, um, you know, right now there, there are no PET-CT manufacturers that offer this PET-CT fluoroscopy technology. And, uh, you know, our vendor, you know, when we, when we worked with them, they really uh, didn't have the, the bandwidth to address it with us until they upgrade their platform, which is years in the future. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're right now just using this third party approach. And, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out ways to automate the push of the CT fluoro image to their computer, uh, which might speed it up. But, uh, you know, it's, it's not bad, even with a 25 second lag. Uh, it's still it's still better than stepping out of the room and waiting for an entire uh, bed position PET CT. Yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> Paul, what about um, I don't know? You know, the, a lot of the work that's being done now is reminiscent of our work in MRI, and it's so hard to get the the, the ablation community to to move from what they're used to and what they're comfortable with. So what do you think it's gonna to take to, uh, to get this very exciting technology, uh, you know, being used by, by more ablationists? You know, it's, it's, of course, as with many things, it's multifactorial. Uh, one, of it, one of the problems is what, we, what I alluded to at the beginning, which is that you know, we need to get more overlap in these domains of expertise. So people are thinking along these lines. Um, from a practical point of view, many departments just think that it's impractical to do an interventional procedure in a diagnostic PET-CT suite. Sometimes they're in a remote location. Um, and so that's viewed as a challenge. But I think one approach is if an interventional team decides that they would like to do this, uh, I think one strategy would be to say, let's work with uh, nuclear medicine to, for example, reserve half a day every two weeks for interventional procedures. And if you don't book something, it's, it's, it's used for diagnosis. So in other words, make a minimal impact on the diagnostic service yeah. to start uh, breaking into the field. And so it's going to be a gradual process. But, uh, you know, the other thing is that there's very little awareness uh, out there about the capabilities of interventional PET CT. And that's kind of what we're trying to uh, address. Yeah, it's, it's so reminiscent. And, and of, you know, MRI guided procedures are suffering from the same kind of uh, short sighted thinking by a lot of people, um, you know. Uh, yeah, I think I think one advantage for PET CT is that it's it's a less cumbersome environment to work in compared to MRI. You know, with MRI, you have to be so careful about the safety issues, and all the anesthesia equipment has to be MR compatible. All the equipment, and uh, MR is amazing 
but uh, with PET CT, we don't have, uh, it's more like working in a CT environment in terms of our uh, equipment and, and uh, support devices. Of course, PET MR is going to come down the pike and uh, you're going to be challenged to uh, put MR and oh. PET together. You'll have the best of both worlds in exactly. Amigo. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, the business plans that, I mean, people like Mike Sulin and others have worked on for years with Onco uh, uh, Interventional Oncology, looking at the upstream and downstream imaging revenue, if you want to be as crass as that, because that's obviously what our managers think of, um, really speaks for itself very strongly when you get into these disruptive technologies. Um, and of course, uh, if you think big picture for healthcare systems, the differentiators in the marketplace, uh, the ability to do unique and different things are maybe things that could be impossible elsewhere. Uh, they're hard to be sort of tangible about, but they're fairly good prescriptions nowadays on sort of a good Harvard Business School projects or something like that uh, to really put together the dollars around that. Um, that you're not just... Uh, sacrificing three hours of diagnostic MRI to do a non-invasive procedure or like MR guided focused ultrasound. And we've had these discussions for years. Uh, this fits right into that same realm. Yes, exactly. Looking to the future, Paul, new novel tracers that look at sub portions of tumors What's the next one up? Is it some of the hypoxia areas that are radio resistant? Is it targeting things that, oh, I don't know, what other markers I can't even think of right now, but uh, some of the various uh, tracers that track some of the molecular functions that might interact with immunotherapies? Uh, you know, what is, what's out there in the future? Well, you know, for example, you know, we have dotatate imaging for neuroendocrine tumors. And, uh, but one of the problems that we're running up against is the fact that it's a very expensive tracer. And, uh, you know, using a tracer like that for an interventional procedure is a bit hard to uh, justify if you don't know that you're gonna get reimbursed for it. So one of, the, one of the things that has been a little bit frustrating is that even though one of the things that makes interventional PET-CT very attractive is the ability to consider many different tracers. From a practical point of view, we haven't realized that yet. Uh, but I think uh, hopefully this will become more feasible uh, in the future. Any other questions? All right, let's call it a wrap. Thank you, everybody. Great, great talk, Paul. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Great job. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.